Good evening and welcome to the Evening News for Wednesday, September 3, 2014. I'm Patty Santos. Thanks for joining us. Making the headlines tonight. Another embattled AFC councillor charged. Nagamoto expected to run against Hughes for AFC leadership at upcoming Congress. Junkie allegedly confesses to murdering Mahaika Mann. U.S. lead project kicks off with consultations. President says Amerindians in a far better place now than before. And distribution of the $10,000 education grant starts on Monday. And now for the news in detail. In this report, you'll hear that another AFC executive and counselor was hauled before the courts and charged after being alleged of engaging in a legal demonstration. Here is more in this report. 48-year-old Nayin Gafur of Madia was today charged for carrying out a procession without obtaining police permission. He appeared at the Georgetown Magistrates' Courts before presiding magistrate Judy Latchman. His charge alleged that on August 4, at 111 Miles Madia, he had a procession without first obtaining permission from the police. Gafur, who was the regional district councillor for the Alliance for Change Party, was represented by attorney at law Kemraj Ramjatan, who told the court that his client was heading for a protest in Madia calling for better roads. He noted that his client had given the police a notification, however, he was still arrested. When asked for the reason behind the arrest, the police said Gafur needed more than just a notification. Ramjitan told the court that his client was doing what he felt was constitutionally right and requested that his client be released on his own recognizance. Police prosecutor Michael Grant had no objections to bail on the matter, but requested that reasonable bail be granted. Bail was refused, and he was released on his own recognizance. The matter will recall on September 8 at the Georgia Magistrates' Courts before Chief Magistrate Priya Sinarai Bihari. Sidi Ramnot for the Evening News. While the AFC grapples to deal with that court action, its Congress is set for October, where Nigel Hughes and Moses Nagamoto are expected to vie to become the party's leader and presidential candidate ahead of the next general elections. They both have their own baggage to carry. Here is more from Svetlana Marshall. The Alliance of Change's biannual Congress is set for October 25 and will see leader and former presidential candidate being removed from the helm of the party going into a possible 2015 snap elections. When the AFC was founded in 2005, it included three parliamentarians who left other parties. Those were Raphael Trotman of the People's National Congress Reform, PNCR, Kemraj Ramjatan of the People's Progressive Party and Sheila Hola of the Working People's Alliance. The party's internal constitution stipulates that the person running for the leadership polls and presidential candidacy of any impending elections can only do so once. Given the party's membership, the most likely discernible candidates for the leadership position of the party would be Moses Nagamutu and Nigel Hughes. When contacted, Hughes said all questions with respect to the party's Congress and candidates should be directed to AFC General Secretary David Patterson and AFC leader Kim Raj Ramjitan. Nagamutu was unavailable for a comment. Kati Hughes, AFC parliamentarian, when contacted, said that she was not focused on the upcoming Congress, but rather an impending snap elections debate in the National Assembly when it reconvenes in October. AFC parliamentarian Trevor Williams said that while he is interested in the leadership post of the party, he has not considered running for the top spot at the upcoming Congress. The main suspect in the chopping to death of 52-year-old Balkasun of Lot 107 Helena No. 2 Mahaika East Coast Demerara has reportedly confessed to the act on Tuesday. As such, he signed a caution statement admitting that he committed the act, a senior police rank confirmed on Wednesday. He is due to make his court appearance before the end of the week where he is expected to be charged with murder. However, a post-mortem examination performed on Balkisun's body gave the cause of death as shock and hemorrhaging due to an incised wound to the neck. The autopsy was performed by Dr. Nihal Singh at the Georgian Public Hospital Mortuary. A senior rank told this newscast that from all indications it was premeditated murder 
Since earlier in the day, the farmer warned the suspect to leave his premises. He reportedly left but was staking out in close proximity to the man's farm. Balkasun would have reportedly left for lunch and it was while he was on his way back to the farm he was attacked and killed. The distribution of the $10,000 cash grant for every student within the public education system will commence on Monday, October 8. The Education Ministry disclosed today, bringing an end to speculations that only some children would benefit. Here is more from Swetlana Marshall. Based on nationwide consultations, the Education Ministry said parents and guardians prefer to receive the $10,000 grant on behalf of their children through money transfer services. In coming days, parents and guardians will be notified of the date, place and time when they will be able to collect the cash grant. According to the ministry, it is currently finalizing the number of children in the public education system. The Deputy Chief Education Officer Donna Chapman said the process is moving smoothly as the ministry is now awaiting the final list of names of children currently beginning year one in the area of nursery and year one in the area of primary. Additionally, the ministry is awaiting data on the number of students entering the secondary system at grade 7. It is anticipated that these lists will be submitted within the coming week to facilitate the completion of the master list of students eligible to receive the $10,000 cash grant. However, the ministry warned that anyone found engaging in any form of malpractice fraudulent or corruption activity regarding the disbursement of this grant will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Finance Minister Dr. Ashni Singh had announced the disbursement of the education grants during his delivery of the 2014 budget. He had said that the grant which will benefit 188,406 families of students of the public, nursery, primary and secondary schools will cost a total of $2 billion. It will complement the National School Feeding Program and the National Uniform Program which have contributed significantly to students' attendance rates increasing. Swetlana Marshall reporting for the Evening News. If you have any news tips or news stories you would like our news team to follow, message or WhatsApp us on telephone numbers 680-9630-6003117 or 617-2867. You can also call our office on telephone numbers 231-0382 or 226-2102, 223-7230 or 223-7231. Stay with us, more of the evening news when we come back. Welcome back. This is the Evening News. Human Services and Social Security Minister Jennifer Webster is concerned about the spate of robberies committed on post offices and strongly feels that some sort of collusion might be involved. Here is more from Bisham Mohammed. In a telephone interview with the Evening News, Minister Webster condemned the action, claiming that the robberies are occurring too often and as such, something has to be done to curb the problem. She recalled only recently the Camerville and the Suzak Post offices were robbed, highlighting that the incident were committed at the time when old age pension and public assistances were being paid. Webster explained that the public is aware that old age pension and public assistance were given out on the first of every month. She also felt that these bandits target the post offices around the same time. She added that there is a pattern in these robberies. Thus, she intends to speak with the Commission of Police for them to investigate the matter thoroughly and to reveal whether these crimes are perpetuated with the involvement of staff. Meanwhile, Acting Postmaster General Abdul Hassan related that he has no information that suggests staff members were acting in collusion. 
But Minister Webster is also calling on the Guyana Post Office Corporation to reassess the security arrangements at the various locations. The minister feels that once a large amount of money is being kept at a specific location, there must be additional security. However, the $4 million that was taken by the bandits on Tuesday from the Lamahan Carmichael Street Post Office is a loss to the entity rather than the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security. Minister Webster explained that the missing monies were from the revolving fund. Bisha Mohammed, The Evening News. Guyana Goldfields Incorporated and its wholly owned subsidiary AGM Incorporated are pleased to announce the signing of a common terms agreement with International Finance Corporation, Export Development Canada, ING Capital LLC, Caterpillar Finance Services Corporation and the Bank of Nova Scotia. The other definitive documentation with respect to its previously announced credit approval for $185 million US dollars project financing facility to fund the development and construction of, and general matters relating to, the 100% owned Aurora Goldfield location in Ghana, South America. With the completion of the facility, the development of the project is now fully financed, subject to the terms and conditions of the facility. The project loan facility will consist, will consist of two tranches, a tranche one facility of 160 million US dollars, and a tranche two cost overrun facility of 25 million US dollars. Despite growing criticisms over the composition of the Ghana Sugar Corporation's board of directors, it has begun to function. Today, Agriculture Minister Dr. Leslie Ramsamy said the revised 2013 to 2017 strategic plan has been placed top on the agenda. Here again is Swetlana Marshall. The board has commenced its review of the sugar industry's 2013-2017 revised strategic plan. Board members are studying the new strategy, the revised strategy, sorry, and um, hopefully in a short period they will release an approved uh, revised strategy. It was explained that the 2014 target has been revised from 216,000 tons of sugar to 219,000 tons. During the first crop, the industry produced 79,995 tons of sugar with 139,000 tons expected to be produced by the end of the second crop, taking the total tonnage to 219,000. While proposals have been made for the 2015 and 2016 targets to be revised, Minister Ram Sami explained that the 2017 target of 350,000 tons will remain intact. Additionally, the revised version of the strategic plan seeks to address interventions that would allow for increased production. One of the major tasks of the new board together with management will be what are the interventions we have to make and I think those are clear. One, we have to increase the rate of mechanization. So whilst the strategy as exists cater for that. The revised strategy will have to amplify and also accelerate the rate at which mechanization is accomplished. Because labor has become, even from 2013 to now, the labor issue has become even more acute. And so all eight sugar estates and at all seven factories, we have to address greater mechanization to compensate for a reduced pool of labor. The corporation has already moved to mechanize 30% of the 48 hectares of fields. This year, approximately 14,000 hectares of land will be reaped mechanically. In addition to mechanization, the corporation has leased 1,000 hectares of land to private farmers who for the first time delivered cane to the factory. At the end of the year, an additional 500 hectares would be leased. Swetlana Marshall reporting for the Evening News. In order to curb the increased number of accidents caused by drunk drivers, the private sector on Wednesday donated five breathalyzer kits to the Ghana Police Force. The details in this report. 
Five breathalyzer kits valued some $1.4 million have been donated to the Guyana Police Forces Traffic Department by the private sector. The kits, which include thermal printers, were handed over to Acting Traffic Chief Superintendent Ravindra Budram at the Police Forces Conference Room on Wednesday morning. Speaking at a simple handover ceremony, Acting Commissioner of Police Silal Prasad pointed out that the number of road fatalities caused by drunk drivers is constantly increasing. As such, he underscored the need for the equipment in their operations to curb drunk driving. The contribution that is ma being made today is extremely critical to our operations. The um, road fatalities for this year is way above what it was last year and a significant amount of those fatal accidents are caused by drunk driving and therefore in order to prevent we need this type of technology to assist our operations. Meanwhile, President of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Lance Hines, stated that as a national stakeholder, the Chamber is concerned about the prevalence and consequences of drunk driving. He noted that the private sector through the Chamber is making the donation as part of their corporate and social responsibilities. We therefore hold the breathalyzers and supporting equipment will be used by the Guyana Police Force to even more actively engage in operations reducing the instances of drunk driving and dealing promptly and severely with those who continue to do so. Let me assure the Commissioner and the Guyana Police Force that the Chamber of Commerce is always ready to support efforts such as these that increase the safety and the comfort of our citizens. The breathalyzer kits were donated by six companies, namely BV Processors, Digicel Guyana, John Finance Limited, John Lewis Styles, Republic Bank Guyana Limited, and Trans Pacific Motorspears. Reporting for the Evening News, Vanu Manik Chan. The health and security sectors are among a list of stakeholders to participate in the annual Norwood Yacht Rally to be held at the Huru Cabra Resort. Here is more from Alexis Rodney. The Ministry of Tourism, Industry and Commerce, along with the Guyana Tourism Authority, has collaborated with the Huru Cabra River Resort to host the event, which promises to be exciting. Co-owner of the resort, Kit Nascimento, said that the event is being held here for the second time. He said the rally is growing and will see an improved number of yachts coming to Guyana. The yachts don't all arrive at one time. The first yacht, which is in fact the largest uh, sailing yacht that has ever uh, sailed into the Estacribo River, I think it is uh, 75 feet long if I'm right which is a, a very large yacht. That will be arriving, we expect, on Friday. The other yachts will arrive between, fr between Friday. The last yacht, we expect, will arrive probably on the 9th or the 10th. The event will be held at the Hurukaba River Resort, located on the west bank of the Esukaba River, just 10 minutes away from Bartica. The rally, which will feature a number of events including a beach party, also comes with three affordable packages. We have three different scales of tickets. There is a $15,000 ticket which includes all your transportation costs and your lunch. There will be a big barbecue. You will have a variety of things to choose from whether you want fish or beef or you want chicken. So you will have a barbecue inclusive with your ticket and that's a $15,000 ticket. You get here to the ministry location at 7.50 on Sunday morning and then you'll be transported by bus to the marina and then you'll be put on the boat and the boat will take you to Barti, uh, to Hurukabra. That was Jem Madu Nascimento, co-owner of the Hurukabra River Resort. The other tickets cost $12,000 for persons who would want to walk along with their own lunch. Another ticket cost $7,000 is also available for patrons who would wish to attend the event with their own vessels. Director of the Guyana Tourism Authority, Indranaut Housing, said that government has always been pleased to work along with the private sector to promote tourism in Guyana. For the Evening News, Alexis Rodney. Stay with us. More of the Evening News on the other side of the break. Welcome back. You're watching the Evening News. 
the principal USAID implementing partner for the United States Leadership Education and Democracy Project lead. The International Republican Institute, RRI, is currently in dialogue with a wide cross-section of stakeholders to implement the program's activities in key areas. Here's Alexis Rodney. This is according to the United States Charge the Affairs, Brian Hunt, who has taken hold of the project. In an invited comment, Hunt told the Evening News that the implementation process is being undertaken in active partnership with a variety of national institutions, including the National Assembly, the Ghana Elections Commission, the Women and Gender Equality Commission, and various youth organizations and civil societies. Hunt reported that the program on August 15, last had held consultations with non-governmental organizations that are interested in providing information on civic education and local government elections. He stated that sessions with the civil society will include the lead programs, local government town hall public meetings, which will be conducted throughout September in selected communities in Guyana's administrative regions. The charge the affairs said following formal consultations with the parliamentary leadership, an initial activity work plan has been developed. In accordance with that plan, the U.S. Aid Lead Program has undertaken preparatory work to provide assistance in maximizing the benefits of the Parliament's redesigned website, enhance parliamentary structures, and strengthen legislative processes. He informed that formal seminars, workshops, and trainings in these and other areas will follow in due course. After months of stalemate and controversy, the government of Guyana had finally agreed to the full implementation of the lead project. Cabinet Secretary Dr. Roger Luncheon had said that a mutually acceptable agreement had been reached, put into rest the concerns government had over its initial design and implementation. The controversy surrounding the U.S. lead project began in late 2013 when government rejected the project, stating that it was not consulted when it was being drafted and further when the Washington, D.C.-based International Republican Institute began implementing the project here. Reporting for the Evening News, I'm Alexis Rodney. President Donald Ramter has said that the country's indigenous peoples are now in a better place than they ever were in the past, as they are achieving greater heights. The details in this report. Speaking at the launching of the Amerindian Heritage Month on Monday, President Donald Ramatar told the gathering that it is now time to celebrate the achievements of Amerindians since they have grown more in the past two decades than any other time in the history of Guyana. The president added that it is time to reflect on those achievements so that Amerindians can anticipate the challenges ahead as they navigate the path to a better economic and social progress. Nowadays. Our Amerindian peoples are showing more confidence and more dignity. In this area, there is no, no place in every area of life we now see Amerindians participating. At the highest level of decision making, at the cabinet of our country, there sits two Amerindian women who are doing a tremendous job for our country. He continued highlighting the many projects government has invested in to ensure the development of Amerindians and their communities over the years. The president spoke about the strides made in the education sector, reflecting on the late President Dr. Chetty Jagan's vision to have every Guyanese educated in order to gain the best job opportunities available. Without a doubt, education is probably the most important means by which we can accelerate the development of our country in general and the Amerindian community in particular. You would have seen for yourselves how heavily we are investing in this area. In our Amerindian communities, we have built many secondary schools with dormitories to house our children. President Ramatar also underscored the importance of the country's indigenous people to ensure the preservation of their culture, specifically their various tribal languages. Reporting for the Evening News, Vanu Manakchan. 
The Burberry's Bridge Company Incorporated on Tuesday donated a blender, among other items, to the annual Lady Annunciation RC Church Parish Fair. The fair is the church's main fundraising activity, and all funds raised will go towards the maintenance of the church building. Head of the Child Care and Protection Agency, Anne Green, says that children who find themselves begging on the streets do not do so only because of poverty. Here is more from Alexis Rodney. Into the evening news via telephone earlier today said that many adults who lead comfortable lives will on many occasions exploit children by sending them out to beg. This, she says, is nothing more than sheer exploitation. Green, who has responsibility for the welfare of Guyana's children, has said that she has had cause on many occasions to upbraid parents who allow their children to be exposed to the elements of the weather, begging for money along the roadside. She said the agency has been running many programs to get children off the streets and carry out such exercises at least once per quarter. She reiterated that adults exploiting children in such manner are in breach of the Child Protection Act and could be so charged when placed before the court. The issue of child begging recently made the news with Caribbean officials calling for a total disband on the growing activity. A Caribbean media has reported that there is growing concern over child labor and indirect forms of begging. Children are being seen working various forms of street hustling, such as the selling of counterfeit movies, stolen electronic devices, or local produce like fruits and vegetables. In more severe cases, child rights activists have reported a high incidence of sexual abuse of children who are expected to provide for themselves. Reporting for the Evening News, Alexis Rodney. While the government has embarked on a $500 million cleanup program to restore the capital city to its former glory, residents are still not satisfied. The Evening News spoke to some of those persons in the streets today. While the countrywide cleanup program has been dubbed a success by government, residents say they are still not satisfied. Yesterday, the local government ministry, which is spearheading the program, said that two additional contractors have been appointed to clean various parts of the city. Some residents are contending that attention is being placed in the wrong areas, while the garbage remains a major problem in other areas. Primarily affected by the disgraceful pileup of garbage, are areas including the various markets and other places around central Georgetown. Here are the views of some of the persons on the streets. Uh, Nobody would want to come to a dirty place and, and, and enjoy themselves. The place is filthy and smelling stink. Why so boys don't look after it? It is very, very bad. For the people them that selling around the market area, they too have fault in doing that. The garbage, they, they throwing the garbage there, they're selling there, and some of them getting up, left in the, the garbage in the same place, you know. The place is so filthy all around. I think they ain't doing enough. They ain't doing enough to cut, got to put out more workers with vehicle for assist the people. They, they're picking up revenue. What are they doing with the money? They're sending the vehicle breakdown. They ain't getting vehicle, they ain't getting vehicle to pick up this garbage. So the garbage leaving there from days and days is piling up. Stay with us, your regional and international news are next. Welcome back and now for a look at some news in the region. The 18-year-old nephew of Antiguan Prime Minister Gaston Brown was shot and killed on Monday night. Police confirmed that Albert Pressurman Brown was killed, the 10th person murdered in Antigua so far for this year. Antigua's Observer Media is reporting that police spokesperson, Senior Sergeant William Holder, said that they're following some leads at this time. Holder appealed to the general public with any information to contact the nearest police station. The teenager's father, Glenn Brown, discovered his son lying motionless in an alley. He said his son was shot multiple times in the chest and he had no idea who did it or why. And internationally, a man who killed an unarmed woman who banged on his door at night has been sentenced to 17 years in prison. Theodore Wafer was convicted of the second-degree murder of Renisha McBride, 19, who was drunk when she crashed her car near his home in suburban Detroit. Before sentencing, he apologized to her family. He said he will carry that guilt and sorrow forever. 
The case raised the issue of the gun use and self-defense in the United States. The nine-day trial was looked at whether looked at whether the 55-year-old had a reasonable belief that his safety was under threat when he was awoken in the night by the pounding on his door. The Demerara Harbour Bridge is expected to close from 12 hours 30 on Thursday, September 4, for a period of one and a half hours, and the Burbies River Bridge is expected to be closed at 11 hours 15 on Thursday, September 4, for a period of one and a half hours. Stay with us. Sport is next. Thanks for staying with us. Now for your sport headlines. Senior inter-county competition bowls off tomorrow. Bangladesh coach banking on batsmen to deliver. And Bell out of the final ODI. Your sport segment is sponsored by Macorp. We believe that everything worth building should be built just once. But that is why we build on culture on trust, on integrity. We exist to do more, better, faster, safer. Your success depends on the foundation it's built on. Everything we do is meant to move you forward. Marco, let's build Guyana together. The inter-county senior one-day competition bowls off tomorrow at two separate venues. The first round is set for the Wales Community Centre ground where Demerara will face Asikupo, while the Demerara Cricket Club ground at National Under-19 team will oppose Burbies. Here is more from Rajiv Bisnat. The tournament forms a part of the preparation for the regional 50-over and 4-day competitions. It has also been used as a benchmark to select the local squad to participate in those regional competitions. This year, the GCB has included a successful on a 19 team, which won both a 3-day and 50-over titles for the first time in the history of regional youth cricket, making it a 4-team tournament. The regional season will start in November and will have a 4-day cricket being played in a home and away format, paving the way for a minimum of 10 games in the tournament. The four-day tournament will then break in January to make way for the Super 50 Limited Overs tournament. The four-day competition will resume thereafter and conclude in March. Meanwhile, Demerara coach Garvin Ned is full of confidence. He possesses the necessary firepower to deliver another successful campaign. Ned, speaking with this sportscast on Wednesday, said once his team play to their full potential, they can be a real destructive force. Uh, we get a group of players who are keen, um, keen to showcase the class, you know, uh, with the franchise cricket in place now, uh, they were looking to, to market themselves uh, and this cricket day basically is uh, for them to perform. And they're keen about coming to the tournament and to defend the title. Round 2 is built for September 6 with a national honor 19 team playing SQB at DCC and Burbies face Demerara at Everest. The third and final round is scheduled for September 8 with Burbies taking on SQB at Everest and Demerara challenge the national honor 19 team at GCC. The final is set for September 13 with the following day being a reserve day. The four day format will get going on September 18. England's Ian Bell has been ruled out of Friday's fifth one-day international against India with a fractured toe. The Warwickshire batsman suffered a small fracture to his left big toe in practice ahead of Tuesday's nine-wicket defeat of the tourists at Edgbaston. Bell played no part in the heavy loss at his home ground that secured India an unassailable 3-0 lead in the series, with Gary Balance drafted into the 11. England will now not call up a replacement for the final contest at Headingley. The Bangladesh coach has pinned hopes on the batsman for the two-match test series against the West Indies as he considers the bowling stocks limited. The details from Avanash Ramzan. The first test begins at Arnesville, St. Vincent on Friday, where coach Chandika Hatarasinga expects Bangladesh to fight hard to enforce a draw. 
In the last series between the two sides in the West Indies back in 2009, Bangladesh had comprehensively beaten a weakened home side who were suffering a player's strike. But the circumstances are quite different now. Bangladesh's overall form has forced Hatra Singha into admitting quite early his target for the test series. He said, and I quote, Our realistic goal would be to draw the game. If we play well, bat well, we will be in the game. Our bowling stock is limited. We must look to bat deep and bat long, score runs and be in the game. End quote. In only his third month, Hatra Singha has so far seen five ODI defeats, the country's best cricketer being handed a six-month ban, and a host of other problems have come up on the field. Bangladesh batsman had a solid showing with the bat in the warm-up game against St. Kitts and Nevis at the weekend, with Mushfiqur Rahim and Nasir Hussain getting hundreds, while a few others spent valuable time at the crease. The bowling, however, was not as impressive as Shivnarain Chandapal and Shane Jeffers racked up centuries for St. Kitts. And that has brought us to the end of the evening news for today, Wednesday, September 3, 2014. Please remember to get a copy of tomorrow's edition of Ghana Times for details of these stories and other news. I'm Petrili Santos. Thank you for joining us. Good night.